Let's talk about why there have been so many coups in Africa recently. Six countries in West and Central Africa have had military takeovers since 2020, and they're all former French colonies. In some of these countries, we've seen things like this. Big crowds protesting against France. We've had the Arab Spring. This is the Francophone Spring. People are fed up with civilians ruling countries without delivering beyond uh, their own interests. So it looks like there's a pattern here. But what connections can we really make between what's happening in these countries? And where do France and Russia fit in? Okay, so these are the six countries we're talking about. Mali, Burkina Faso, Chad, Guinea, Niger, and Gabon are all now being run by military leaders after the army kicked out the civilian government. Niger and Gabon are the most recent. In all of these places, we've generally seen popular support for the coup leaders, although the idea that they're all just motivated by the public interest is a bit simplistic. In the eyes of many observers, they have conducted these coups very much as a cynical power play. We should also add this disclaimer. It's hard to make simple comparisons that apply neatly to all six places. Each country has its own particular context. In Gabon, for example, the trigger for the coup was the contested re-election of President Ali Bongo. His father had ruled for decades before him, and Bongo was accused of rigging the vote. A lot of people celebrated what they see as the end of the Bongo era. Notre pays est libre. Vive la liberté du Gabon. Vive à tous ceux qui ont contribué. Gabon is very different from what we are seeing in other parts of West Africa. This is specifically about the electoral process. Niger's case is slightly different too. President Mohamed Bazoum was a democratically elected leader. His election in 2021 was the country's first civilian to civilian transfer of power. One explanation for the coup in July is that it was a straight up power struggle. Bazoum was making changes to the military leadership, and one of his generals, Abdurrahman Chiani, turned on him when there were rumors that his job was on the line. So it's easy to find differences between the various coups when you look at the local context and the specific conditions in each country. But there are also some common themes that can help us make sense of what's going on. First up, the feeling that the civilian governments in these countries just weren't delivering. Remember, these are some of the poorest countries in the world. Most of them have valuable natural resources. For example, Gabon and Chad have oil, Niger and Mali have uranium, Guinea and Burkina Faso have gold and other minerals. But that wealth hasn't been reaching ordinary people. There is a, a, a general disenchantment with the way that democratic elites have uh, handled power. The common thread of all these coups in uh, West Africa and Central Africa basically are economic stagnation, corruption and insecurity. That brings us to our second theme, the security problems that these countries face. It's especially bad in Mali, Burkina Faso and Niger. They're all in a region called the Sahel, which has become a stronghold for armed groups linked to Al Qaeda and ISIL. And here's a statistic that might surprise you. According to one report, almost half the deaths from terrorism around the world in 2022 happened in the Sahel. That was more than South Asia, the Middle East, and North Africa combined. As the security and humanitarian crisis has skyrocketed in the Sahel, the populations have become increasingly impatient you know, with the ineptitude and um, the failings of their own Governments. In Mali, Burkina Faso and Niger, the coup leaders have held up the security situation as part of their justification for taking power. Just listen to what they said in Niger. Nous, forces de défense et de sécurité, avons décidé de mettre fin au régime que vous connaissez. Cela fait suite à la dégradation continue de la situation sécuritaire, la mauvaise gouvernance économique et sociale, now, our last common theme is a big one, and it's the upswell in opposition to France and its role in the region. France is the old colonial power here, so we're talking about a relationship that's rooted in a history of exploitation, one that goes all the way back to the slave trade. And a lot of people feel that the exploitation hasn't stopped and instead continues in new ways, what's sometimes called neo-colonialism. It's this idea that France maintains an unequal relationship with its former colonies in a way that prioritizes its own political and economic interests. 
One example that often comes up is how French companies are heavily involved in mining the natural resources of these countries. For example, operating Niger's uranium mines and extracting the uranium that France needs for its nuclear power plants. Now, those exports do generate revenue for Niger's government. France has also been one of the biggest donors of aid to the region, so there are different layers to what's going on. But still, the backlash against what many see as France's outsized influence in its former colonies is something that's come up in several of the recent coups. Because the previous civilian leaders were often seen as being too cozy with France. The people that you saw in the street, in Niger, in, in Mali, in Burkina Faso, all clapping and dancing for the coup authors was not because they loved these guys. They blamed their political elite and they, they blamed the colonial master, the, the French, for not trying to solve their problem, but exploiting their resources and li while leaving them in abject poverty. Another aspect of the anti-French mood has to do with the security threat in the Sahel that we mentioned. France has been one of the main Western countries to send troops to fight the armed groups there. It first sent soldiers to Mali in 2013 and had some success at the beginning. But even after several years of French boots on the ground, things weren't really improving much. Its focus has been narrowly on counter-terrorism. That doesn't deliver much benefit for the local people. Those jihadi groups have actually become more powerful on the ground as they've exploited local uh, community disputes. So the, the people have seen France's intervention and then connected the dot and said, well, you've intervened, but things have actually got worse. People started to see as if France was playing, um, a, you know, a double side, uh, that they are feeding this uh, conflict uh, to try to take benefit of it. There is, of course, no proof of that, but a lot of people uh, throughout the region believe that. And this is a narrative that many of the coup leaders have also used to their advantage. They've placed themselves pretty firmly on the anti-French, anti-colonial side to win public support. Those military factions saw which way the wind was blowing and have used anti-French sentiments certainly to um, bolster their own credibility. The leaders in Mali and Burkina Faso have pushed out all French troops, and the Niger leaders have called for France to withdraw the one and a half thousand French soldiers there. Now, in parallel with that anger that we've been seeing directed towards France, there's also something else going on, and that's growing support for Russia. After some of the coups, we also saw big crowds waving Russian flags. Where you have had France being driven out, that vacuum has been filled by Russia. Russia has a long history of courting African states since the Cold War, and part of its interventions even in that era were couched in anti-colonialist rhetoric. One of the main ways that Russia has grown its influence has been through the Wagner Group, a private military company with ties to the Russian government. It provides governments with soldiers, often in exchange for access to natural resources. The Wagner Group is not just a mercenary group, it's also uh, a logging company, it's uh, also uh, an information and communication company, uh, it's, it's, um, it's mining. It's also serving a purpose for these uh, governments in the region that seek alternative partnerships to uh, the West. Wagner has been active in several African countries, including Mali, since 2021. The coup leaders there brought in Wagner mercenaries to help fight against the armed groups in the Sahel. And there's been talk about the military leaders in Burkina Faso and Niger bringing in Wagner forces too, although so far there's been no confirmation of that. But the future of the Wagner group in Africa just became a lot harder to predict, since Wagner's leader, Yevgeny Prigozhin, was killed in a plane crash in Russia. A lot of people suspect President Putin may have orchestrated that crash to take revenge for a mutiny that Prigozhin led against the Russian state in June, but the Kremlin has denied playing any role in his death. I'm not quite sure that by removing Prigozhin, Wagner's machinery is just sort of suddenly going to disintegrate. Whether it's still called Wagner, or whether it will be the same network of individuals now being supervised with closer allies, more accountable to Putin, they will want to keep that machinery that Wagner has built on the ground because it's achieved a number of objectives for them 
access to resource, undermining the credibility of the West. So when you look at the forces at play with all these coups in West and Central Africa, there's a lot going on. You've got the domestic issues in each country. You've got regional issues like the security challenges in the Sahel. Then there are these bigger geopolitical forces too, the pushback against France and Russia's own ambitions to grow its influence. It's all adding up to this sense that coups are in the air. And the big question is whether more countries will follow.